is one of my favorites. Um, just uh, good afternoon on this snowy day, everyone. I'm Sue Fasciani with Tiger Home and Building Inspections. I am the marketing manager for Eastern Connecticut. And I am here today with brother and sister, Joe De Laurentiis and Kara Golden. Uh, Kara is director of marketing and she also um, manages the Western part of Connecticut as I'm in the East part. Joe is owner of Tiger Group and has been licensed for 26 years as an inspector. He carries the pest control license and is certified for commercial inspections as well. Um, Joe will be presenting today, but before we get started, I just wanna talk a little bit about Tiger and that is that we're a family owned company since 1992, that's 28 years. We've been doing residential and commercial inspections statewide throughout Connecticut and bordering counties and towns uh, seven days a week. Uh, we also have a fully trained and certified staff for environmental uh, water testing and for radon. Our inspectors are all uh, licensed with the wood destroying insect um, license so that we can include that at no extra charge in our residential home inspections. And also we have a mold division. So if you have clients that are concerned about mold, you know, send them to us. We could do a mold assessment and uh, testing as well. I do want to mention, um, as you get to know our inspectors and build the relationships, you know, please let our office staff know, Kara or myself, if you have favorites, because we can put them in your profile as a preferred inspector. Um, and also some of them have specialties, such as what's listed on the slide there. We've got 203K, antique homes, a waterfront, you know, some are better with uh, engineers and new buyers. So whatever um, you have thrown your way, you know, just, just let us know and we'll help you through that, that process. Um, we will use the chat button. So keep that in mind. If you have questions as they come up, just throw that um, on the chat and we will answer them when we get to the questions. And we are going to do something a little different today um, for our raffle $25 Panera gift card. We'd like you all to get your phones out right now and go on to Instagram and you can follow us at Tiger Home Building Inspections. Or if you already follow us, please um, make a comment today about today's presentation. And um, at the end, Carol will be able to see all those and she can, um, she's going to pick a winner from that. So um, I think we're all set to move on. Joe's going to talk a little bit about COVID right before the present presentation. So I'll turn that over to Joe. Thank you, Sue. So quick reminders on uh, just some COVID protocols. We're seeing some things over the last month or so start to loosen. Uh, out there in the field, and some of you may have experienced some of the same. Uh, always remembering how thankful we are to CTR uh, for getting us all deemed essential uh, way back, uh, what, eight, nine months ago as it is now. Um, but reminder that participating in a home inspection, CTR says that only the inspector, the principal buyers, and their agent should be present. Uh, more and more over time, we started to see the whole family come in, the neighbors, the friend who's a decorator and all these things. Um, part of that's our staff, part of that's you all uh, exposure and also remembering the sellers that may be uh, affected by some of this, having more and more people uh, coming to their homes. So uh, unfortunately, numbers are starting to rise a little bit and things are tightening up a little bit in Connecticut again. Uh, so looking back to some of these protocols is beneficial. Of course, wearing a mask is one of these requirements, uh, as it is for all of us out, out there today. I won't go through all these, but some key points on office procedures. We are starting that discussion about attendance at the inspection uh, when our clients contact us and talking to them about maintaining social distancing, or some actually choose to just stay in kind of a central location and the inspector will update them uh, through the process. Um, gone are the days of being able to be actually shoulder to shoulder, right? Looking into that electric panel. And of course, we're still doing our clients, getting them all the information uh, as we go. The inspectors themselves are sanitizing their equipment before they enter another home, wearing personal protection equipment. When requested, we can wipe down into your surfaces for some sellers that are, are more concerned. And of course, continually uh, washing our hands. 
Um, just a quick reminder on uh, uh, access type things. Um, the key is the bottom uh, bold here. We want to reduce return visits for these same reasons. Um, people are working from home. Kids are home going to school, as all of you mentioned. So uh, um, more and more, it's difficult for sellers to allow people into their home. So they commit to doing the inspection on a certain day. Uh, let's say we couldn't get to the attic because all their clothes are in a room or oh, geez, we can't inspect the basement because that's where my kids are doing their schooling. So starting to think through some of these access issues ahead of time, both when you're representing buyers who are going to have the inspection or when you're representing sellers uh, is extremely important to prevent return inspections. Moving on to our presentation, um, understand that this was a three hour presentation and we trimmed it down uh, to a one hour office presentation and then further trimmed it down again for today to the to 30, 40 minutes or so. So uh, we could go on and on and on about antique homes um, and certainly I'll touch on, on some overview and the general goal is to create some awareness for all of you. Uh, some of the conversation is about helping you um, sell these homes, how to um, trigger buyers and sellers to, to realize the positives uh, of some of these older homes. We're blessed to live in a region where old house doesn't just mean early 1900s. You see signs of 1700s, 1600s even in some cases and, and everything in between. So um, Confucius says, study the past, if you would define the future, uh, realizing that a lot of the things uh, uh, residential um, real estate wise, architecture wise, uh, that we put into our houses of today stem from um, design issues in the past. Uh, a lot of those were performance oriented things. Uh, the Dutch door is an example, right? Um, we don't have them around too much anymore, but in order to allow uh, fresh air in, but keep the animals from coming in the house, we'd have those half, half door Dutch doors. Uh, a lot of transom windows and side lights around doors were allowed, uh, allowed light in so that we didn't have to use as much electricity back in the day, if they even had that, uh, maybe different lighting. Starting with colonials, um, the salt boxes, the capes of yesteryear, a very common design. Steep roofs were the norm, um, center chimneys as well. Very minimal on the decorative trim, uh, really a, a, a more of a, a, a basic a shelter almost type house. Um, the salt box uh, kind of evolved from a lean-to that was used to be added to the back of a two-story uh, house. And part of the reason for that adaptation of the lean-to was to prevent taxation. So no different than some of us that might uh, finish our basements and maybe not tell the tax man and, uh, right away. Uh, that's how a lot of the things happened uh, in the old days as well. Uh, a one-story structure was uh, taxed differently than a two-story structure. Um, this house is uh, 1660 and it's in Niantic, the Thomas Lee house. So it's a great example of the older colonial salt box. Then of course the Victorian era, uh, we still see a lot of these details. Uh, of course, uh, a whole bunch of um, uh, subcategories to this Victorian area, era, excuse me, uh, um, fall in uh, underneath that time frame. Um, all of these have little pieces of Victorian design uh, to them right down through what we still see commonly used today on a lot of our waterfront, a lot of the, the shingle style uh, type details there. We'll move on to some of the Gothic characteristics, uh, noticing that large tower, a uh, very ornamental type design, um, some terracotta and or slate on the roofing. And of course, uh, a lot of these rounds came into play over windows and arches over doors uh, and such there. Throughout the presentation, you'll see we, we pulled um, houses uh, throughout the state uh, to give some examples of, of how all this architecture um, falls in. And then some of these Gothic revival uh, areas, uh, uh, we see a lot of decorative trim around uh, all of these uh, gables and railings and such over entry stairs as well. Mansard, you know, sometimes called Second Empire as well. Um, a rather interesting roof design, always kind of a bugger for us to try to get up on these. Many of them initially had roof hatches, but some of them were roofed over. Uh, so 
Uh, usually uh, now we have some sort of gutter line here along this area. And then of course the, the <clears throat> common um, characteristics are this, uh, what, what is kind of a hip roof, but two pitches of a hip roof forming that mansard design and the dormers on uh, that lower area as well. You'll see a lot of decorative coins on the corners. Uh, um, I lost my mouse there. Uh, corner decorations coming down the sides and of course uh, uh, the porches uh, as well. In Queen Anne, we stay with the very decorative type uh, designs here. This house is up in Bristol, as you can see. Uh, a lot going on with these Queen Anne's. We don't have the uh, uh, the turret and tower in, in the actual picture, but you see some examples here. Uh, the porches are almost on every Queen Anne, whether they run just across the front or around. And this is where you saw the introduction of the large bays uh, to add to uh, uh, the architecture as well. Probably a decorative stone uh, on the foundation and of course the, the tall windows that are similar to that um, uh, prior picture that we saw of the, uh, the mansard. Um, you also see in some cases there's decorative pediments. We don't see it here. They have returns on these decorative uh, areas, but here you have the full pediment running across in the gables, uh, which it kind of falls in line of detail pulled from some of our um, Greek uh, revival as well. So we'll talk more about that coming up. And of course we move into modern um, in the modern characteristics. Uh, this is that famous falling water, right? Frank Lloyd Wright. And then it had a lot of design elements in this modern era from Henry Green. Uh, very boxy uh, flat roofs or low slope roofs. Um, sometimes curves were introduced as well. Um, the, the other uh, subcategories that came out of this modern era are also, uh, some of our lower slope ranches and, and even falling into some in of the crash. House. Nick or Steve, look at this house. Look. Um, somebody's got their mic on. Um, so there's some uh, uh, of the ideas there uh, behind the modern characteristics. Uh, this is a, a great tool because there are so many categories and subcategories. The boxes are the primary categories, right? So we have a long run of the colonial era. Um, federals, very common in our area as well. And then of course the Victorians, and we'll talk a little bit about Greek revival as a subcategory there. Our arts and crafts run through uh, with some of the more decorative area uh, designs there. And then of course the modern, which we just touched on uh, um, through this uh, last section. We'll do some quick quizzes. You can all, I'll give you a second to guess and then I'll give you the answers. What do you think of this one? We just went through it uh, briefly there. Queen Anne. Queen Anne, someone got it. There it is. Up in Waterbury, um, see the octagonal turret. It's an 1875 build. Uh, it's got that uh, slate uh, tile that we mentioned. And of course, the, uh, the, the, um, the big turret as well. Um, there's all your decorative areas of trim on the porch. Uh, and how about these? Anybody have an idea on the left? And then we have the right. So Greek Revival on the left and East Haddam residence and uh, some of the key components uh, there to keep in mind are that large pediment, uh, the transom uh, windows, uh, freeze windows up in the attic, a little bit lower slope roof uh, on that as well. And then of course the Italian eight, um, uh, you see on the right there, uh, those areas uh, have a, a little bit lower slope roof of course, the most prominent of these is the tower uh, up on top there. We started to see some wider overhangs. Uh, uh, the primary function of those other overhangs was to shed the water away from walls and or the perimeter of the building. Um, and then of course, more decorations with the coins on the corner and, and some other um, trim elements there, so. So we'll focus on Greek revival a little bit. We see a lot of these in our areas. Um, the multiple chimneys, again, that um, attic window, a uh, frieze type window. And then of course, our, our large pediment and this little pent roof as they determine it. And then of course, the entry areas as well. You started to see decorative trim around the doors 
uh, and then side lights uh, around the doors, maybe not here, but in some cases, um, transom lights as well. See these characteristics uh, listed here. There's that uh, story and a half transom uh, type window uh, in place. And then there, our large decorative entry is exaggerated there. Cornice type trim started to come into play as the Greek revival developed. We started to see more details and ornate trim work as we came up to our roof line uh, as well. There's a little more detail on the doors when we talk about side lights. Again, it looks real nice on our doors today in, in newer construction, but remembering back to when we didn't have electricity, we wanted to maximize daylight coming into the home. So these are some of the ways uh, that they did that with window locations. See how tight these two windows are to the front door. They're not true side lights as part of the door uh, um, like these are, but they're tight here to bring light into that foyer or uh, entryway as well. So some of the things to know about showing or selling these homes is starting to know your styles. You know, it's not going to be appropriate unless you really specialize um, to, to memorize all this stuff. But uh, maybe it's a listing presentation or a buyer that's specifically interested. So you brush up on your historic styles, uh, know roughly the dates or periods. Uh, we can get you that little graph or, or, or get something similar so that you have an idea. Um, describing some of the elements. It's, it's always interesting to see how uh, much people enjoy knowing uh, why is that window there? What's that little steel bar on the old stone staircase? So, well, that was to clean the mud off of your boots. So some simple things that we've kind of lost over time. Um, research that style, present it to people. Um, individual house characteristics are always fun to know, right? Some owners will have a lot of history uh, about the house. Uh, so these are the things that you can do to uh, um, impress your clients as you go in. Some of the construction um, processes and, and tools and such, um, foundations, framing, shingles and siding, understanding why we used some of these materials. Uh, for instance, why was the shake roof so prominent? Well, it was really all we had. We didn't have any other weatherproofing materials. So you had uh, guys that would sit and hand split shakes uh, days on, on end. Uh, you started to realize when we didn't have uh, uh, nails or, or, or a lot of nails or they were very expensive, why we use so much timber frame joinery. So um, understanding some of the tools and the workmanship is helpful to understand why things were built the way they were. Draw knife would clean uh, bark off of logs. You have some uh, decorative uh, trim um, and, and column tools here with a lath. And then of course, standard woodworking tools and blacksmithing tools. Once we started having the ability to, to make uh, metal type things, the blacksmith was a, a very important trade. Shaping timbers. We see these rough uh, hand hewn timbers they may be. Um, if you've never seen what how that is created. You, you have the round sitting on the ground, you chop all the edges off to make it, you know, a, a squarish log and then come back with the ads, which is what creates those little chop marks that we all see uh, uh, in houses on those, the rough hand hewn uh, log. So that's what the uh, uh, marks are from the ads there. And of course the fro up here is what I mentioned. That's how we make those uh, hand split uh, um, shingles or shakes as it may be for um, sidewall or roof uh, uh, waterproofing. Then we had the introduction of the sawmill. It's important to talk about this. It's one of the most common ways that you can try to date houses uh, or additions and changes in houses. We'll talk a little bit about old house uh, antique home inspections. And, and one of the, the things that, that make them interesting for us as inspectors is figuring out Okay, yeah, the original house is 1705, but there's three additions that were added to this thing. Uh, you get in the attic, you see different framing. Um, starting out with uh, uh, different types of, of sawmills is leaves different indentations and marks on, on the wood. We had water powered sawmills at first, then steam developed uh, uh, in, into sawmills as well. And as power continued, you moved into circular saws and things that left different marks uh, on the timbers. Quick question break, anything coming in on the chat? 
Sorry, oh. I need to unmute myself. Uh, we don't have any questions at this time. Uh, we do have a fairly small group. So if anybody has a verbal question while we're breaking right now, let us know. Otherwise, we'll continue on. I just have one question. I also wanted I might... to share. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. My question was, I know when I first started real estate many moons ago, and I went into one of the older homes, and I noticed, of course, that chimney was on the angle. And when you're used to a straight up and down chimney, you're going, oh, my, we're in trouble. And then I understand uh, they're built that way for a reason. So if you could share some of that with us. Absolutely. And, and we'll have an image that, that shows that as well. Okay. But I'll, I'll touch on it now. The, the general rule there was, um, again, looking back to, to our uh, source for metal and waterproofing, if you imagine uh, the peak of the house and, and bringing your chimney out through the absolute ridge or peak, it's a lot easier to shed water versus if we were down lower on the slope and we put the chimney up, we have to have more flashing and there's more ability for water to get in. So you come up through roughly the center of the house and then you say, all right, we got to get over to the ridge and you can work slowly over by corbeling is what they did uh, the chimney to get over there. So, and when we get to the image, I'll show you some of the concerns with uh, an older uh, corbeled chimney. They're, they're, many of them are still intact and working just fine. Uh, it's a uh, lack of maintenance and allowing water in for a hundred years that, that caused damage to those. Thanks, Sue, Joe. Did you have a comment, Sue? I just wanted to let everybody know they can temporarily unmute themselves with the space bar. So if uh, Joe asks what style a house is again, you could just click on the space bar real quick. Thank you. We'll talk a little bit about inspecting antique homes. Why does it take longer? Um, a lot of questions we get, just like that chimney comment, very fitting. Is it supposed to look like that? Uh, what's different about these and, and can anyone inspect it? Well, you should have uh, a lot of experience with older homes um, to inspect them. Uh, there's a, a great variety of conditions that they're in. It's, it's kind of funny because Many of them last a long, long time and are still certainly viable, but people forget that there are well-constructed homes today and poorly constructed homes today, and there was the same back then. Uh, most likely, a lot of the poorly constructed homes back then uh, are no longer with us, unfortunately, uh, but um, you can see a little bit of both. And then most importantly, alterations and modifications, as I said, uh, that's the biggest uh, uh, thing that challenge for us as we get to a site. Uh, you had a small cape that had an addition to it in, in the early 1900s and then another one in the 70s and uh, they added insulation, they changed windows, they put vinyl siding over it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are all the things that make it difficult to unwind some of these. Uh, we started talking about chimneys a little bit. This picture is a chimney cradle. So one of the things that people tend to raise an eyebrow at when they get down in that old basement is, wow, what's that eight foot by eight foot square of brick, uh, excuse me, of stone and wood timbers and such doing in the middle of my basement? Uh, that was the foundation or the cradle that was underneath um, these center chimneys. You had usually multiple fireplaces or at least one fireplace in the house for a heat source. Uh, and, and you had to build a separate base uh, for that. So here you have some steel that was added, a steel beam and a lolly column. Uh, and again, trying to unwind this, is it stable? Does it need more work? What were they trying to do in the past? Uh, tends to take some time. And I'll just point out some of the timbers that we find intermixed uh, with um, chimney cradles uh, as well. And this is an example of someone who started trying to shim a floor that was uh, bouncing and squeaking. You see the newer shims here, but the root of the problem is this large split. And the reason for this is that this is a timber sill with a mortise, and then they, they uh, put a half tenon on the joist. So the only part uh, of the floor joist that's bearing in the sill is this upper tenon section, and the bottom section split off over time. So this is one of the key areas that we inspect. Of course, everyone knows the sill is, is very important, but uh, when we have mortised joists that, that don't sit on the foundation, they sit in the sill with a tenon, uh, uh, we can get this splitting. Not that difficult to correct, uh, but certainly of something that is different in an old house versus newer types of construction. There's our corbelled chimney for you. 
Um, so you can see that slant that we were speaking about and they can be much more aggressive of a corbel than that as well. And moisture, as I mentioned, is, is the big issue with this. Is it an unlined flue most likely because as the corbeling angles, uh, there were no clay flue liners that could make turns like that and such. Uh, they may have relined it with, a, with stainless steel, which is certainly a question to be asked or, or something to be updated. Um, when the, when the uh, corbels get steeper and we're getting water straight in, if they don't have a, a cap on top, that, that angled section uh, tends to be where the, 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 the most of the wear or deterioration is. And we often see repairs, as I said, and alterations. This house, they actually added solar to. Um, so they came back in and put these um, uh, collar ties in. They were bolted uh, um, connections on all these and the load that was added with the solar was not that great. Uh, of course, we see some reframing on the gable end wall there to, uh, to modify some, some windows as well. So as things continue to evolve and change, um, you, you went from houses with a fireplace for heating to adapting central heating systems. Um, cisterns that used to be in basements were replaced by public water supply. Um, and then, of course, as indoor plumbing evolved, people started drilling holes and trying to make ways to to put all these mechanicals into houses. So um, these evolutions over all these different years and eras of construction uh, do have some impact on these buildings. And again, it's part of what uh, makes the inspections take some time. Here's an example of adapting a, a uh, heating system to an old fireplace. Uh, believe it or not, this is the flue for a gas uh, boiler um, coming up from the basement. They cut through this wall so that they'd have a clean out to clean out the base of the chimney. And then this flue pipe turns and goes up the chimney. So a little bit of a surprise when you open up the first floor closet and see that they've uh, uh, vented the um, heating system through, through the closet space. If you haven't seen knob tube wiring, that's uh, what we're showing here. And uh, is it safe? <laughs> Interestingly enough, knob and tube is a very safe wiring system. Um, if you imagine the two wires that are inside, uh, three usually actually ground and, and hot and neutral inside our typical uh, plastic sheath or Romex wiring, what you're seeing here is one of those wires separated from the other. So in order to get zapped as it may be, you'd physically have to hold on to both of those. Uh, the problems became when we started insulating our houses, a lot of times the knob and tube would be run through the floor structure of an attic and we throw insulation over it, now it starts to overheat and we have potential um, um, fire concerns. The real reason Knob and Tube has a bad name is the um, uh, homeowners insurance industry had a lot of losses uh, from improperly maintained Knob and Tube, modifications to Knob and Tube and such. Um, so uh, that's where you run into concerns with it is, is with homeowners insurance. And here you have an example of some of the modifications. There was actually a second story added to an original cape. It doesn't show very well in that picture, uh, but you can see some of the reframing on the gable end wall. Obviously the aluminum gable end vent was not original to the old house. So uh, when you get inside, you can recognize uh, post and beam framing on the first floor and some stick framing from early 1900s uh, on the second floor. Uh, and they tried to match uh, details and trims uh, throughout. Um, not something you would know at a quick glance um, to get into the property. So what do we see? We, we broke down kind of the top three um, conditions that are important when inspecting older homes. And the first one speak toward, speaks towards any house, but most importantly on an older house is, is house truth or looking at the whole picture from the exterior you take a nice broad walk around. This is where you start to see any overall settlement and things like the ridge line of the building. Um, you're not gonna see uh, any big wall movement in this masonry structure, but often walls can be out of plumb, maybe a sill rots and that wall rolls out a little bit. Um, um, you wouldn't see that when you're standing right up next to um, the building there as well. So. Uh, noting overall settlement in structures leads you to get inside and say, why is that occurring? Uh, yeah, I need to get in that little crawl space and see if there's a foundation or a sill issue. 
Sometimes we have support that's added and you have to kind of analyze uh, the performance of that, how long ago may it have been done, what was the potential purpose. Uh, on the left, we have uh, a dormer that was added to an older structure. And of course they uh, separated uh, the framing here, tried to supplement that with a vertical. That vertical doesn't sit on anything. So you could actually, the starting point of this question was, uh, the second floor hallway that had a, a, a belly in the ceiling. Um, so as you work your way back up, you can see the, the, the representative changes over the years uh, and the supplemental support. And on the right, we have uh, properly added supplemental support. Below this is a load bearing wall. Uh, they came up, added a purlin at mid span on the structure and, uh, and some um, uh, struts there to support that. And of course, the second uh, most prominent issue is moisture penetration. Uh, upon approaching an older house, uh, you may uh, see a, a, a rubble stone foundation or maybe decorative above uh, soil line. Uh, sometimes we have little concrete borders poured around the perimeter because there's moisture issues. Landscaping has often been elevated and brought up and up and up uh, higher on the building so that siding is right at or near. Um, uh, soil where it used to have a foot or two feet even uh, of height there uh, back in the day when it was built. So we often see uh, moisture issues. On the left, they attempted to control some of that with draping plastic over everything. It was working to keep humidity down, but uh, based on the exterior conditions, which were putting a lot of water next to a, a stone foundation, um, water still getting in and there's all kinds of dampness underneath the plastic. So better to control from the exterior than uh, just have a vapor barrier. Uh, and here you see some people, uh, um, if it's a, a more flat wall than a, than a real rubble wall, come back and, and uh, stucco, or as we call it, parge coat, um, some of that to help control uh, water seepage. The general comment to clients with older basements is stone foundation, you, you ha always have the potential for water seeping. Um, manage the water from the exterior, gutters, drainage, good landscaping practices in order to reduce uh, uh, any of that seepage. And then the third one is chimney issues. We touched on corbeling, uh, uh, not, not an issue in and of itself, but um, can, can lead to questions on flue liners. Uh, of course, maintenance over time with chimneys is very important. Uh, chimneys are out of sight, out of mind. So I understand why most homeowners, you know, don't know what's going on up above the roof line with their chimney. Uh, but this is where we see uh, uh, some, some issues with uh, older homes. Flue liners, most of these houses will have just a, a brick flue, uh, maybe more than one in a large chimney that's separated for multiple fireplaces. Um, but lining those flues uh, can be an important safety addition. Most chimney sweeps, when they come to clean an old fireplace, are going to talk to an owner about using that fireplace appropriately uh, and if they intend to use it consistently uh, and or add wood stoves and things that a, uh, a flue liner should be added. There's some deterioration that occurs in, in um, older chimneys. This is an example of what happens. So it went from being a wood fireplace to uh, an adapted to a, a coal boiler, then to an oil boiler. And that deterioration uh, um, slowly ate through brickwork and such. And you can see a hole right here to that um, flue. In this case, looking up into a uh, multi flued uh, uh, large chimney, they came through with that stainless steel liner that we talked about. This is looking up actually into a fireplace smoke chamber. Uh, so they took one fireplace and said, we're not going to use this anymore. We're going to run our, our, our oil heat uh, flue liner up through it. So some examples of what goes on inside those big, massive chimneys. Some of them you can actually get right underneath and almost stand up inside them uh, to see what's going on. Touch quickly on Sears homes, primarily just because I, I think they're really neat. And when you run into them, it's, it's often curious. There's a lot of pride in, in, in many owners that um, have these houses. Um, they were the original 
kit. Uh, you know, they literally would load a full house uh, onto a rail car, unload it and truck it over to a, a home site. You could go through the uh, Sears catalog and choose which model you wanted. And they had varying levels uh, of detail for them, uh, but came with the plans. Everything came numbered and uh, put together. The interesting thing about these is very, very heavy on quality of materials and trim details inside. Uh, so really a treat when you see one. Um, hopefully a lot of the, the really nice uh, uh, trim that many of them have this gorgeous oak interior trim that hopefully hasn't been painted over and such. In some cases, you'll find the packaging labels um, stapled downstairs still on the main uh, uh, beams of the basement and such. Uh, so um, these are some of the ways to match them. You can go back into the catalogs and find uh, certain details that match um, houses that you're looking at. I've seen a couple of them in the uh, Ivoryton Centerbrook area. I know of another one uh, up in uh, East Haddam as well. So um, keep an eye out for these. They're uh, uh, pretty neat when you see one. The times or dates for those uh, are early 1900s, 1908 to 1940 was the availability. Um, again, the trim details are usually the trigger. You come right up to the front door and it'll just be a uh, uh, like craftsman style uh, ornate uh, front door and then the en entry area into uh, you know nice wood floors and trim areas. Um, sometimes uh, Sears Roebuck will be listed as a designer on, on some of the records, uh, 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 municipal records as well for these. Some fun pictures for you. Can anybody see the image? We started out with the dog on someone's lap, so it's kind of fitting today. See the dog head that's molded into the uh, column. Just some fun pictures that our guys have found over the years. Uh, this represents the adaptation of plumbing to some of these older homes. So in order to add a cast iron drain, they simply cut through all the framing. And then of course, historically, they had some issues with deteriorated subfloor and you see some plywood that was added uh, over that as a part of the repairs. These are kind of interesting. This is an old fire safety uh, um, component that would have been sitting over top of a boiler in an old uh, house. Basically, it's triggered by heat if there's ever a fire, and then it releases uh, um, a chemical, um, carbon te tetrachloride. Unfortunately, it's considered a carcinogen. It's not a great thing to um, have in your house. It's okay if it's just there, but if it were ever to release, uh, or God forbid, uh, you know, someone thought it was a pinata, you'd have uh, some issues there. And there's a chimney. Um, one of the reasons why I keep this image in the presentation is in older homes, one may be confused when they see a clay flue liner sticking out the top of the chimney and you would say, oh great, maybe the chimney's been rebuilt. Um, in some cases that rebuild was only from the roof line up and they just stuck the flue liner in that far. In other words, the rest of it is still an unlined heat flue. Um, and then additionally, this is a, a foil tape they would usually use for duct sealing. So rather than reflashing when they did the roof, uh, they just put some uh, adhesive uh, tape all around the base of the chimney. Yeah, obviously, it's not going to work. And then not uncommon to see uh, some mortar joint deterioration um, in any age chimney, but that's the beginning of the problem. Maintenance uh, would help to keep that from getting any worse. So know the styles of the old houses. These are tips to help you um, when uh, showing them or when uh, getting ready for a listing presentation. Um, we also have this prepared in a PDF document that's going to be sent out to you by email. There's, a, I think, uh, more like eight or 10 bullets on that. Um, but probably the most important tip is start at the front facade of the house and have some of those little details, maybe some of the trim details or uh, the door entry details and such to talk about and never end up in the basement as your last stop. They, that, as I see it, is, is probably the most intimidating part of these old houses to uh, buyers. Uh, they get down in there, some refer to it as the dungeon, some uh, uh, um, won't even bother going down there because they're, they're not interested in, in uh, you know, the crouching uh, low basement. So 
Um, you don't want that to be the last thing that people see, right? Um, we always try in conversation and inspections is prepare uh, uh, buyers to be realistic about the age of the house. Um, you need to have an appreciation for things like uneven floors, uh, but you know, you get the nice wide plank floor uh, for some settlement that's occurred over the last hundred plus years. And realize that in, in many of these properties, you're uh, uh, moving into the house as, as the next steward of that home, the next person to, to maintain it and keep it going forward to maybe modify it further uh, and improve it. Um, but if you, if you start to create that kind of mindset uh, for certain buyers, they really do start to appreciate uh, the, that they're next in line to, to, to take care of a property that has been around for a long time. And then, of course, setting expectations, right? There is, uh, it is a work in progress. Uh, they do um, require maintenance, just like any home does, uh, but potentially a, a, a little bit more uh, than some. Any questions? Comments, stories? Mute. Uh, there's nothing in the chat, um, but if anybody has anything verbally they wanna share, feel free or story about an antique home. Yeah, I found the information very helpful though. I mean, many times I'll go buy an older home and wonder what style it is. So I think that tip sheet you're giving out about age and time they were built will be helpful. Great. Great, thank you. So just to close, uh, selecting a home inspector, obviously stay on the, the, the track of uh, antique homes. If, if you have a client that's purchasing an older home, make sure you're talking to somebody who is aware of older houses. We have several inspectors on our staff who work in, in, in antique homes uh, many times a week. So they're not intimidated when they get there. They're not gonna make comments that might set someone off to be more concerned about it. And like I said, the idea is to, to get people to understand that there's an appreciation for uh, um, the type of building, the great details that went into them. Um, on any uh, uh, selection of home inspector, uh, remember that um, inspectors should be fully licensed. There's an internship that's required to get your license in Connecticut and some inspectors can continue to work just on the intern permit, actually own and operate a business without ever getting their, their full license. So one of the benefits uh, at Tiger is we have our own training program. Uh, it's a, a, a sequential set uh, of uh, uh, sections that they go through as part of uh, their training process and at the same time then entering into the 100 inspections that are required for their state licensing. Insurance is not required for home inspectors in the state of Connecticut. So I would be telling you that if we didn't carry insurance, um, most people think of errors and emissions insurance, but remember even as a listing agent that liability insurance is important. What happens if someone comes on a property and they damage something? Their ladder innocently blows in the wind and lands on the seller's car. Uh, how are people covered for these types of things? Just like all of us in everyday life, right? Our car insurance, our homeowner's insurance, uh, et cetera. And then of course there's risk of injury. So workers' compensation is, is important as well. Uh, at our company, client service is extremely important to us. So our office hours uh, are, are daily eight to eight and then weekends eight to six. So we have availability to help our clients and their representing agents schedule appointments, uh, change appointments, take messages, all these kinds of things. Uh, in addition to our home inspection service, we have commercial inspections available. Many of our, our prior residential clients that are purchasing commercial are, are repeat customers. And then of course we offer all the uh, applicable environmental tests, uh, including mold, radon, water testing. Wood destroying insect is extremely important for older homes. You're gonna see a variety of insect damage. A lot of uh, powder post beetle type damage comes up, older termite damage. Uh, uh, so having some more knowledge about that, having the proper license to fill out paperwork for someone that is potentially a, a veteran uh, or, or using a, a, another FHA type loan, uh, we can give them the national press control form and that's all included in our standard home inspection fee. Connecticut standards of practice as part of our licensing, we have to adhere to those. 
our report has to satisfy those as well. And then most importantly, reputation, credentials, and experience. Um, if you have any particular needs, um, get in touch with myself or Kara or Sue. You know, I have a client who uh, uh, wishes for an inspector that can do this, or can you help me with um, talking to this client ahead of time? And, and we can help you with any of those things. Um, lastly, if you run into a situation where you have a question, uh, we all have our phones in our pockets, take a quick picture, send us an email, uh, whether it's an old house detail or a uh, brand new construction with something different in it. I'll turn it over to uh, Kara. Thanks, Joe. Um, so this is your very last reminder about Instagram. Thank you for all my new followers. Uh, my Our raffle winner today is Just Add Home, Susan Warner Lambert. So congratulations. Uh, Susan, if you either want to um, shoot me a text, that's my cell phone on the screen right now, or you can message in your um, email or your address and we can connect and I can get that gift card out to you. Also, uh, Rachel's going to follow up with a uh, email and it's going to have the handout that Joe referenced on the flyer, tips for promoting and selling antique homes. A lot of the points that we discussed today in the presentation. Uh, and lastly, most importantly, I think from this presentation, you can see the value of working with an inspector that understands and is experienced with antique homes. So if you're looking for a referral for your clients, you can reach out to Sue or myself. You can speak to our office staff. Um, for those of you who are familiar with some of our Tiger inspectors, a few of our guys that are antique home specialists, uh, you have Alan Williams in the Eastern end of Connecticut, Bill Denslow as well, Eastern. Uh, Bill Rourke is really up in the Hartford County area. Of course, uh, John Horrocks and Tim Healy, New Haven and Fairfield County. And then of course, Joe Jr. right here doing your presentation today. So if you have any questions, uh, our cell phones are here and I should add our emails to this slide, but uh, we're always available to help you out with any questions you might have inspection related. Thanks. Thank you all for attending. Great. Thank you so much, Tiger. Great. No, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Happy Halloween. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Happy Halloween. My mask. Oh. <laughs> now it's good having, good having a resource like this. Um, I've I've taken a, a more than a more than a few uh, new younger couple you know new home buyers who are like yeah you know I I saw this home and I know I know it just needs a little care you know and you're like it's more than a little care you know <laughs> and like this is a labor of love and and you know they're they're awesome homes you know they they were built to last when they were built to last and. Uh, <laughs> So it is, yeah. No, it's 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 a, this is a, this is a great presentation. Honestly, uh, I I enjoyed it. <laughs> That's short and sweet. I loved it. Thank you. And one quick thing before we end off, um, the association will be participating in the Paddington Bear Program again this year, the Be Homeful for the Holidays, and so we are um, looking for people that will help deliver the bears to the shelters when the need arises. So uh, I will be following up with an email to everybody from the presentation. Like Joe said, I'll send you that flyer and uh, I'll also mention the deliveries. And if you'd like to participate, please send an email back to me and let me know. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much for uh, joining Rachel. the call today, everybody. Thank you. Again. Thanks for having us. Good seeing everybody. Bye bye. Bye guys. Take care. Have a great Happy weekend. Halloween. Happy Have safe Halloween. out there. <laughs> Turn your clocks back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Saturday. Saturday. Bye Nugget. Bye Nugget. <laughs> Doug, you're my partner for deliveries again this year, right? That's right. Okay. Wouldn't just check the other way. Just checking. <laughs> Nugget, you're so cute. <laughs> I can't wait to come meet you. I didn't realize that was you.